Welcome to Gateway Church Wirral Online. We're so delighted that you're with us this morning. So great that you can be a part of our live streamed gathering. Just to welcome you to this space and what we're all about. Um, to say that we as a church, we're all about seeing people meet with God, encounter him for all his goodness and his grace and for lives to be changed by him. As a church, we want to see a world transformed, made better and better through every life transformed by the grace of God. So our hope and our prayer for you today, meet with Jesus in the things that we're saying, in the things that we're singing, in the way that we're opening up the word of God, which is alive for us today. We want you to know Jesus, know that he loves you, know that he has a plan for your life. And as we're going through our gathering this morning, do please connect with us here in this live stream space. You can fill in our connection card. The tab, I think, is at the top of your screen. Request prayer if you'd like to. There are great, friendly people who would love to pray with you. And do just connect with us in any and every way that you'd love to. As a church, we gather. That's what we're about today. When we come to the close of our gathering, I'll tell you how you can connect with us going forward into the week. So have a really great time. Be blessed. Enjoy yourself and enjoy Jesus we pray. Good morning church. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to have some reading of the Easter story of this resurrection story and we're going to pray as we welcome our King Jesus this morning. If you want to, you can grab one of the Bibles that are there out with you. We're in John chapter 20, and you can follow along if you'd like to. This is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that this community of saints, this household of faith, this church for whom you died, that you have risen for its establishment, its perfection, and its glory at your coming. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would make this church a church of runners. Lord Jesus Christ, that we would run hard after the risen Christ. That, Lord Jesus Christ, we would not just be people who say Christ is risen, but we run We run to be partakers of the resurrection. We run to be close to you, even though we don't fully know where you are or what you're doing, yet you will find us. Make us runners after you, Christ Jesus. And the scriptures continue. Mary stood, weeping outside the tomb. And as she went and stooped to look into the tomb, she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Let us pray, church. 
Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today, this resurrection day, Lord Jesus Christ, you would do the wonder work of resurrection and turning weeping into gladness that you would turn tears into joy, that you would turn our aimless wanderings into the garden to the clarity of taking the gospel into this world, that, Lord Jesus Christ, you would turn the confusion of hearts and minds into the certainty that we are with you and you are with us. Christ Jesus, our Savior, would you speak our name today? Even as we proclaim your name, your glorious name, would you speak our name today? Would you call us, God? Would you commission us, Lord Jesus? Would you send us in your ways, Christ Savior? And the scriptures continue. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And Lord Jesus Christ, again, I pray over my brothers and sisters, this church, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, if there are any here and they are fearful one way or another, I pray Christ Savior that they would have such a sight of you today that, Lord Jesus, all fear would be gone only to be left with the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And Lord Jesus Christ, I pray again that this church, your people, we would be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Amen and amen and amen. We're going to praise the Lord today because I don't know whether you've heard that Jesus is alive that Christ is risen. And because I think we need to kind of get that into us a little bit, we're going to kind of embody the word of God to us today. And here's what we're going to do. Look, because some of you here today, you know, there's maybe some weeping, there's some fears, there's some confusions. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, Look, I I don't know whether you want to run to somebody. Maybe you want to run to somebody. But whether you want to run or walk to somebody, I don't really mind. But go to them. And would you proclaim this? This It's only possible because Jesus is alive. And because he has ascended and say to them, be filled with the Spirit of God. Would you say that to someone? If you want to run to them, go run to them. That would be great. But if you just want to walk to somebody, then go do it. And say to somebody, be filled with the Spirit of the risen Christ. Be filled with the Spirit of the risen Christ. Be filled with the Spirit of the risen Christ. Hallelujah. 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 greatest day in history it's at this feeling you have rescued me sing it out jesus is alive the empty cross the empty grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out jesus is alive yes he is he's alive and oh Happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away. And oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. Oh, when I stand in that place. Realize, meet him face to face. I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. And the joy, joy and perfect peace, the deadly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away, and oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. 
happy day. I'll never be the same. And no happy day, a happy day. You wash my sin away. And no happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Come on, church, celebrate. Forever I am changed. And oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day, that you have saved me. And oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day, yeah, yeah, and oh. What a glorious day, what a glorious way, that you have saved me, and oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious name, yeah, and oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away, and oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, and oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed. I'll never be the same Forever I am changed And I'll never be the same Hallelujah! 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 Amen. Hallelujah. How good is our God? took us from death to life, took us out of that grave with him. Because I was buried beneath my shame, and who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you when you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. When the old made new. Jesus, when I met you, when you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, Hallelujah. Oh, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness 
into your glorious death. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but your chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you call my name, shut it out. I ran out of that grave. Hallelujah. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. What a glorious day when you took us from the grave. Quiet. 
we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. fighting for us heaven's angels all around my delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown you're my help and my defender you're my savior and my friend by your grace i live and breathe to worship you and at the mention of your greatness in your name I will bow down, in your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. And let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow, by your grace I live and breathe to worship you. And hallelujah. lost become the found you can never be defeated for you wear the victor's crown you are jesus the messiah and you're the hope of all the world by your grace i live and bring to worship you and hallelujah But the grave could not contain you. 
for you where the victors cry. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you have overcome. You have overcome. And You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. You overcome. You overcome. lift our voices together this morning declare that he wears the victor's crown he has overcome he's glorious he's victorious and he's yours and he's mine he's our savior he's our redeemer he's our helper he fills us with the spirit he is the coming king and we worship him hallelujah to be gathered together as the church. It's so great to see lovely faces here in our building, to know there's more of you via our live stream. And there's a sense whereby we have come running out of that grave. We are alive. believe this morning that there's many of us and it's almost as though you need to come running out of the grave again <laughs> God is calling you out of death into life this morning and uh, can I invite you maybe to if you're willing to close your eyes and to consider the call of Jesus Christ this morning he's calling you to come from death to life there's a lot of you here this morning and maybe you're still in those places of death and 
You haven't yet come into the life that Jesus has for you, but he's calling you this morning. And then there's, there's others of us here today. And I, I think for one reason or another, our lives feel like they're more about death than life. And Jesus is calling you today. And so I, I want to extend that call to you this morning. Just listen to these words and hear Jesus calling you. And I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, and I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. And I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Hallelujah. Jesus is calling this morning. He's calling you this morning. This morning, I, I just want to pray in two ways this morning before we come and encounter the risen Christ in the Word. But we're going to encounter Him even right now. I want to pray this, these two ways. I believe there are some of you here this morning, maybe some of you joining us via the live stream, and you've, you've never really made that conscious decision to come out from death to life. The Bible says that this is the will of God for you, to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus, the beloved Son of the Father. He wants to take you from darkness and death and place you in the loving embrace of the Father. And there are some here this morning, some joining us, and, and, and you've never yet said yes. Yes. I want to drift into this. I don't just want to enjoy some of the attributes of this. I want to come into the loving arms of Jesus. This is a way of describing what it is to be a Christian. And if you're saying today, this day, yes, yes, I want to come from darkness to light, from death to life. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. I want to place my life in his hands. Then I want to pray for you today. Church, can I invite you? Let's all join in prayer. Can we do that? And uh, look, encountering Christ, it's not really a spectator sport. So let's just come to him with our eyes closed and our hearts lift before him and we say, Jesus, we're yours. And if you're here this morning and for the first time or the first real time, you want to say yes. I want to place my life in the hands of Jesus. I want to become a Christian. I want to follow him. Then I want to pray for you this morning and so that I can pray for you really well. Can you do something while heads are bowed and eyes are closed? Would you just look at me and just wave at me really quickly? And if you do that, I'll see you. That's great. I can see someone at the back there. Is there anyone else? Yeah, wonderful down here at the front. That's fantastic. Is there anybody else? If you're on the live stream, just click the link and there'll be someone will pray with you there in the building. I'm going to ask one more time. If you want to wave at me to say, yes, this is what I want, for real, then wave at me right now and I'll pray for you with these two others who have waved at me. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that this is what you do. You move people from death to life. Lord Jesus Christ, because you are the author of life, you speak life. And life comes and no one can take it away. And so, Lord Jesus, over these two in this building, Lord God, I pray and proclaim your life today. Lord Jesus Christ, bring them to life. And Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would fill them with the fullness of your life. Lord Jesus, take everything that is deathly and of death away from them, Lord Jesus. Cleanse them of their sin. Make them new. Help them to feel brand new in you today. And Lord Jesus, I pray that they would know that from this day, they're walking in the fullness of life that you offer to them, that you guarantee, and that it's life for today and tomorrow. It's life eternally. Jesus Christ, encourage them. Encourage them, I pray. Now, everybody here in this place, 
If you're saying, actually, you know, my life is in the hands of Christ. I know that I've come from death to life. But look, there are things of this world. There are things of brokenness. There are things of death. And they're hurting me. They're, they're all around me. I can't really see anything but them at the moment. And I need Jesus today. Then I'm going to invite you to do something. Because we believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is for everything and everybody. Whether they're here or whether they're elsewhere. We're going to lift one another before the Lord. So if you need to call out to Jesus and say bring your life into my circumstances. To my loved ones. To my need. To my surroundings, neighborhood or family. Whatever it might be. If that's you this morning then I want you to just reach out to the heavens and say Jesus. I say, Jesus, call me out of the, of the grave. Call these circumstances, Lord Jesus. I need to come out. Just reach, reach high to heaven and say, Jesus, I hear your call. I'm believing you this morning. And Lord Jesus Christ, I want to come on out. I want to come on out. And I want to come out in today. I want to come out into this resurrection day. I want to come out into light and life. Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray, Lord God Almighty, over each and every person who's reaching out to you this morning, that, Lord Jesus Christ, you would hear the cry of their hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that, God, you would look upon them, Lord Jesus Christ, tenderly and powerfully. That, Lord Jesus Christ, you would reach out to them with those arms that were stretched out upon that cross. And, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would uphold them today with your strong right hand. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray today that you would raise them, Lord Jesus Christ, from things of death into things of life. And Lord Jesus, for those who are they're raising their hands and they're doing so on behalf of loved ones, family, friends of different circumstances around them, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that God, you would see them, Lord Jesus, and you would satisfy their desire, Lord God, today. Lord God, I pray that you would bring healing, Lord Jesus, through these, your servants. I pray, God, that you today you would bring salvation through these, your servants, Lord God. I pray today that, Lord Jesus Christ, you would meet every need that is represented in this place and the resurrection Lord Jesus would be the hallmark of our experience Lord God you are the same Christ Jesus today who rose from the grave those many years ago your life is not diminished or dimmed Lord Jesus Christ the light of life shines upon us today and Lord God we are trusting in prayer that almighty God you will accomplish the things of your kingdom Lord Jesus Christ I, I pray, and Lord Jesus Christ, I commit into your hands all of these dear ones and those that we represent. Christ Jesus, this world needs your resurrection. This world needs your resurrection. We need your resurrection. Our families, they need your resurrection, Jesus. Our friends, they need your resurrection, Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that this will be a day of lifting, lifting from death to life. Oh, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. When you'd like to, you're more than welcome to take a seat. Look, when we come to a close with our gathering today, um, we're going to worship God again. And we're going to celebrate the life that is found in Christ Jesus and in no one else. But I think it'd be right for us. Um, to pray and, and at the conclusion of our gathering I, I think we're going to pray for a couple of things we're going to pray even as Jesus did that resurrection day he breathed on his followers and he said receive the Holy Spirit we're going to pray for folks to be filled with the Holy Spirit today and, uh, and the Bible tells us be being filled with the Spirit and so we're going to pray that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit today we want to pray as well um, I, I just feel very keenly that some of you, and you, you feel very heavy today. There's just a weight. Um, there's, a, there's a weightiness. And, and uh, not to diminish them in any way, shape, or form. But the Bible teaches us that these present sufferings cannot compare with the eternal weight of glory. And this is the promise of Christ Jesus today and eternally. And what I believe God wants to do for each and every one of us, if we're willing, is that we get to cast our burdens to him because he cares for us. 
And, and we're going to do an exchange, a beautiful exchange today. And so as we conclude, we want to pray that God would lift off those weights. Uh, the Bible says that they entangle us. They weigh us down. We're going to lift them off. He's going to lift them off. And instead, we're going to have a sense of the weight of his glory. The weight of his glory. I know Resurrection Sunday. I don't know. I, I feel sometimes I'm supposed to kind of hype it up. <laughs> you know, it's all supposed to be excitement and buzz. And you know, I, I, I wish we did shout in church every day. I think it'd be good. I think you could, you could all do with a bit more shouting. Yeah, well, the two of you got on it. I think, yeah, come on. Could all, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we can all do with a bit more shouting hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. Amen, so be it. We could do with shouting these things. Um, I think, you know, something of the weight of his glory, actually, is what God is wanting to do amongst us today. Um, just that we would feel that. Wow. If you've not got the message via a parent's phone or whatever, the Bible class are heading out. So if you're aged 11 to 14 in years 7 to 9 at school, um, then you're more than welcome to head out with Libby who stood at that back door. And she would love to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with you today. Um, and that would be great. Um, so you're welcome to go. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ saw what was hidden become visible again. Jesus Christ did die and he was buried and on the third day he rose again. Amen. Wonderfully, profoundly, this is a, a, just, just this incredible reminder, isn't it? And I, I hope you kind of felt the sense of it yesterday. It teaches us that when Christ was in the grave, just because we can't always hear Jesus, can't always see what he is doing, it does not mean that he is absent. He is present and he is at work. And the resurrection speaks to us that what was hidden, we can now see again. And now we see dimly, we see in part, but we will see him fully face to face for he is coming again for his own Jesus is alive he's risen in glory and he's coming again and this morning we're going to consider the, the, the power of the resurrection on Friday we considered the power of the cross and it was good to do so but today we're going to consider the power of the resurrection what really was going on what really was going on and so I just want to read to you a few verses from um, the book of Colossians in the New Testament. And we're in chapter 2 there. And um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, is writing this teaching. And he's writing about things hidden and things revealed. And he's writing about powers. And he's writing about what Jesus did on the cross and when he rose again. <clears throat> and so in verse 6 of chapter 2, Paul says, Therefore... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted <clears throat> excuse me, and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. I know what you're like, you guys. You're mad keen on philosophy, aren't you? <laughs> you'd be surprised we, we get captivated by ideas and thoughts and ways of living that's what Paul's talking about according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world Paul is teaching that there are things that are seen ways of living powers and, and stuff that goes on in our world but behind the scenes there are underlying spiritual forces at work he says, don't be taken captive by these things, living according to those spirits and not according to Christ. That's the way we should be going. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. God himself. 
was upon that cross for you and for me. God himself went into that grave for you and for me. God himself took up his life from the dead so that you and I might be alive. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Elsewhere in the scriptures we're told that it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is anyone here glad that Jesus is in them and that they are in Christ? These are things, and you know, you might not feel like, I don't know how I see this, but these are the truths. These are the truths of the Bible. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's this work of being made pure of the fulfillment of the law which was beyond you but not beyond Jesus. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. That's this profound sense that is shown for us in baptism. You go into the waters and it's kind of like you're being hidden. And, and you're leaving behind the old life. It's like it's being buried, it's gone, it's dead. You come out of the waters and what is revealed is the life which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's the powerful stuff that's happening. And you, who were dead in your trespasses, in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I don't know whether you know what this is about, but but in the culture of the day that Paul was writing within that Greco-Roman culture, if people had debts, those debts were written down on actual bits of paper or papyrus or parchment or whatever it was. And all of the debts were kept there. When we apply that to ourselves, the Bible teaches us that we have had debts, sin. It's something that has to be paid for. And none of us can. But the Bible teaches us, oh, thank you. Is it going to be that long of a sermon? That's a a good one. I hope you've all got one of these. (laughs) The Bible teaches us that right here, an actual record of your death, an actual record of everything you've ever done wrong, past, present, and future, Every way in which you've separated yourself from the love of God, an actual record of that was not presented to you for you to pay. But it was cancelled because Jesus had it nailed to the cross. He had it nailed to the cross. And you know where those nails went. They went through his hands and his feet. It was costly for Jesus to pay your debts. But he did it for you. And he did it for me. Do you know why he did it for you? Do you know why he did it for me? Do you know why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. This is the call of Jesus that brings you out from darkness to light, from death to life. It's the call of love. He he can't convince you. Some of you, you're so caught up in the way that you think. You think you're right. And the only thing that will break through your thinking is the love of Jesus. Some of us, were so caught up in our ways of living, we think it's going to make us full of life. Nothing's going to break through except that Jesus loves you. This he set aside, your debt, your sin, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The Bible teaches us there was an awful lot that put Jesus on the cross. There were Roman rulers, yes. Religious authorities, yes. Your sins and mine, yes. There were powers and principalities, wickedness, evil itself put Christ upon the cross. But Jesus Christ has conquered it all. What was going on at that cross? Jesus crucified, he died, he was buried. He rose on the third day. Christ is risen. 
And as we've said already, there are powers at play at the cross. And there are always powers at play, at work within our world, seen and unseen. Powers seeking to subvert, subjugate. Powers seeking to subvert, pervert. Powers seeking to lord it over and denigrate. Power is dangerous. Power is dangerous. It's one of those things that gets taught in every house to every child when they first make a play for that socket or that hob or that power cable. No! Or is it it just me? Some of you much calmer parents carefully go over and explain to your children why they should not stick that fork into that socket. I just yell. (laughs) I just yell. There's a fair bit of yelling that happens in our house. We really shouldn't be in a semi-detached. It's not fair. Uh, you, you don't mess about, do you? And kids grab the power cables and like, oh, here's this necklace. Let me put it around my sister's neck. Or, you know, you don't, power is dangerous. It's effective. It does something. I, I, and yet, it's not just kids who want to kind of muck about in these ways. It's the human instinct, isn't it, to try and take what is powerful and to seek to tame it, to kind of make ourselves lord and master over that which is powerful, to use power for our own ends. It's not just a child thing. It's a human thing. And we consider in these Easter stories the Pharisees, the priests, the temple authorities. We know, as the Bible teaches us, that they wanted to kill Jesus. They didn't simply want to run him out of town. They didn't simply want to shut him up. We know that they wanted to kill him. And we know this from their own words. When Judas, prompted by his conscience that he had betrayed an innocent man, when he came back with those 30 pieces and, 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 and there they were in the temple, he said, take them. I've betrayed an innocent man. They said, when the, the, the money was scattered on the floor, they said, we can't put this into the, our coffers. We can't use this for our own evil ends. This was blood money. Blood money. In the New Living Translation of the Bible, it even goes so far as to say this was payment for murder. Blood money. Let's take a step back and see how it came to be this. In John chapter 12 and verse 19, we see how all of the religious elite schemes had come to nothing. So there they said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Does anybody ever feel like in life you're getting nowhere? Does anybody ever feel like sometimes, no matter how hard you think things out, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you kind of marshal your forces, which no doubt are considerable, yet still it seems like you're getting nowhere? Or is it just me? The three of you are honest this morning and nodding at me. Um, It sometimes just seems like we're getting nowhere. I'm sure here this morning we're not the kind of folks who are are trying to trip up Jesus or or test him and find him wanting or trying to kind of put him to shame and that's not what we're doing and yet as we seek to live our lives independently of Christ as we rely upon all of our own wisdom and understanding and abilities and, and don't actually turn to Jesus and don't actually follow his ways aren't we aren't we actually putting Christ to shame See, this is getting us nowhere. And the Pharisee said, look, the whole world has gone after him. The whole world has gone after him. And you know, in those moments, in those days, actually, who had gone after him? Well, a big crowd, sometimes even thousands of people, but it wasn't yet the whole world. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it incredible that even these wretched people who were seeking to undermine Christ, yet still, they prophesied what was true. Because here we are 2,000 years later, and now all around the world, people have been waking up and, and are yet to wake up. And they've woken up and they've looked at one another and they've said, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. See, the whole world has gone after him. And it's true. And I know it's true. Because I've got family in Singapore and they woke up and they said, Christ is risen. And, and here we are and we're saying Christ is risen. 
And, 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 and over there in Canada, on the, on the West Coast, they're going to wake up. Have they woken up? You had a text, okay. Yeah. Um, Christ is risen. He's risen. The whole world has gone up. No schemes can confound this Christ Jesus. No schemes can confound him. And yet people continually try to manipulate power to try and subjugate, to press down, to win over, to, to establish themselves. We sometimes try to establish ourselves as lords of our own circumstances. See, this is getting us nowhere. And so they hated Jesus because he stripped them of their power, their power over the ordinary people, their power to use and abuse the people to bolster their position of authority, of prestige, and of wealth. It's a common human behavior. You know, we read these Easter narratives and, you know, we look back, don't we? And because we're so pompous, maybe that one is just me, we look back and we're like, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Oh, and if I was Peter, I wouldn't have denied Jesus or lopped someone's ear off with a sword. If I, if I was Thomas, I wouldn't have doubted. You know, I, I would have said, I don't need to see Jesus. I'm too holy. Just, you know, you might need to see him, but I'm perfect. Oh, come on. We're people, aren't we? Go on, look at somebody near you. Is, are there people near you? Are you a person? We're people. It's common human behavior. Given a little bit of power or position, many will use that to garner more. We get a taste for it. We get a taste for status. We get a taste for everything being just so. But we get a taste for this in the other aspects of our life. Maybe when our bank balance is, is seeming pretty good, we get a taste for it. And then when it seems worse, we feel some sense of injustice. Maybe when we're well and our bodies are strong or when we're young, we get a taste for it. And we get weaker as we get older. I, I haven't reached that stage yet, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> You don't look at me like that. <laughs> and, uh, our health sometimes fails. And we're like, this shouldn't be right. I, I should be strong. I should be in charge. And we get a taste for it in so many different ways within our lives. Still others use the power that they have to put others down. After all, if you can't elevate yourself by means of good character or positive contribution, then at the very least you can make other people look worse than you. And that's almost as good, isn't it? It's not just kind of how well am I doing, but it's how much better am I doing than someone else. Some of you, you might remember that classic um, sketch spoofing the British comedy system and you, you've got to be of a certain age or have been raised by people of a certain age to have seen this but there would be John Cleese John Cleese really tall guy and he was there with his bowler hat on and he was this upper class toff and he looked down upon the taller of the two Ronnies, Ronnie Barker. Do you remember this? Have anyone seen this sketch? And there he would be, and he was this middle-class man. And, and, and it was all right. He didn't mind being looked down on by the tall, tough John Cleese, because at least he could look down on Ronnie Corbett, who was the working-class man at the bottom. And it's just how it goes, isn't it? You know, maybe we don't mind if others look down. As long as I can look down on somebody... During the American Revolution, there's a story told of a, a man who was dressed in civilian clothes, uh, and he rode past a group of soldiers who were repairing a small defensive barrier. Their leader was shouting instructions at the other men, but he was making no attempt to help them at all. Asked why by the rider, he retorted with great dignity and pomp, Sir, I am a corporal. The stranger apologized. He dismounted and proceeded to help the exhausted soldiers. When the job was done, he turned to the corporal and said, Corporal, next time you have a job like this and not enough men to do it, go to your commander-in-chief and I will come and help you again. With that, George Washington 
got back on his horse and rode off. It was no less than the commander-in-chief, George Washington, who got off and did the work when the corporal would not. Who are we in that story? In our better moments? In our worst moments? And so in their lust for power, the religious elites denied and demeaned everything they claimed power for. They they paid blood money for clandestine betrayal. this This wasn't a fair cop. This wasn't a good arrest. They came and found him by means of a spy in a garden at night. I think that says it all. And then there was a kangaroo court of trial of Jesus. It was actually entirely illegal, both under Roman and Jewish law, to try him at haste overnight. But they did it anyway. And their hatred boiled over into spitting, hitting, mocking Jesus as they showed themselves for who they really were, twisted by a lust for power and hatred for Jesus. Pilate, the Roman ruler, is no different. Three times in the gospel accounts of the trials of Jesus, he declares that Jesus is innocent. Three times. It wasn't, I thought he was innocent, but now I'm wrong, he's guilty. Three times he declares him innocent. His wife comes to him and says, have nothing to do with this innocent man because I've been troubled by a dream about him. He knows he's innocent and yet he still performs the the play of washing his hands and hands Jesus over to be put to death. With one eye on an angry mob and another on his masters in Rome, Pilate determines that his position depends upon doing away with this one they called king of the Jews. Time and time again, the powers that be seek to maintain the status quo. Woe betide anyone who unsettles the boat or calls them out or who highlights the plight of the needy or the suffering and demands that something should be done. Woe betide anybody who calls out the neatness, the tidiness, the orderliness, the comfort of our circumstances, who points out to us that we have power and agency and resource and points out to us that there are many who actually within the the structures of this world are struggling and suffering and actually there's a call upon we who have power and possibility to meet those needs. we like it the way it is but it's not just this downward dominating power that we see at play throughout the Easter narratives rising up from those streets of injustice and from hearts of outrage comes a revolutionary and anarchic zeal which was prevalent at the time of Christ Jesus zealots revolutionaries. They were common in those lands of Judea and around about small provinces that were subject to Roman occupation and rule. Of course, they would be. Who wants to be ruled by military overlords with a pagan religion and shocking morality? We know of many sects and of organizations that rose up before and indeed after Jesus, promising to overthrow the Romans. Indeed, even one of Jesus' own disciples was called Simon the Zealot, which teases the wonderful idea that he might have been drawn to Jesus, thinking that he was joining this new revolutionary organization. I think he got a wonderful surprise. As we look at the cross, we need to understand that crucifixion with all its brutality, the great effort, this is not an easy thing to do to somebody, the great effort of violently abusing somebody and suffocating a person in such a public shaming that crucifixion was really only used for violent revolutionaries. It was only used for people they thought were going to destabilize the public order. It wasn't used for ordinary criminals. I know in the Eastern narratives, sometimes we're told that it was two thieves either side of Jesus. The word doesn't really do it justice. They were actually insurrectionists. They were revolutionaries. Maybe they had stolen, but they were also destabilizing the regime. The whole point was to shame the ones being crucified, to take away their power, to have them stripped bare and placed upon a cross. And it was so evident that there they were powerless. And the two crucified with Jesus are understood as revolutionaries. The one in the middle should have been Barabbas, we know, who we're told was a notorious 
revolutionary. This is how the authorities saw Jesus. They saw him as a revolutionary, somebody who was destabilizing the order. That is why, in their mind, they used a cross. They wanted to publicly shame him. They wanted to take away his power. Here is the tragedy. We might have sympathy for revolutionaries. We live on Merseyside. You know, it's the way around here, isn't it? <laughs> I hope you don't mind me saying, but when Erin was new to the area, um, she had some sense that there were two different political parties that tended to have the majority. But she was like on Facebook with people she was getting to know in Merseyside. And she was like, are you sure? Is there not only one party? This red one. Um, I, you know, it's Merseyside, isn't it? You know, We like a bit of an insurrection around here, don't we? <laughs> it wasn't a political statement. You can vote for whoever you want. I don't mind. We have sympathy for revolutionaries. We see them as plucky upstarts trying to, to, to bring down the proud elites. Yet the Easter story and all our human stories, in fact, show us that revolution actually always abuses power, even as it seeks to overthrow power. Revolution from the streets tries to overthrow power, yet the heart of the revolutionary is rarely overthrown in humility. Pride is their downfall also. We see this in that one crucified with Christ who remains defiant even as he is utterly helpless, defenseless. It seems farcical, doesn't it, that he's shouting orders at Jesus even as he cannot physically, materially, spiritually, emotionally do a single thing. Yet with some of his last breaths, he tries to say, I'm still powerful. I can tell you what to do. He shows that human urge to angrily prove our power. When we feel like we're on streets of injustice, when all agency has lost all autonomy, even our humanity feels like it's being stripped away, and we want to continue to say, I'm still in control. I've still got a plan. I can order others around. I can make this happen. It's going to be okay. How about you today? How's your power playing out? Do you find yourself in a good place? Have you got plenty? Have you got power? Is your power downward toward those beneath you? Or do you find yourself in places of injustice, of struggles, of, of hurts? Maybe hatreds are being fostered within your heart. And the power that you have from those streets is going upward. And it's angry. What power we have, what power we seek to maintain. We rarely let our lives be changed by the needs around us. We give, but we rarely sacrifice. The ministry we offer doesn't often change us or humble us or bring us down to those who need us, need the Christ in us. And as with all power plays, we see pride at the root. Why should we be changed? Why should we sacrifice? We fail to see that we are, on the one hand, perhaps emperors wearing their new clothes. We think we're doing great but we're as naked as those on the cross. Fooled in our shame, even as we think we are something. Or on the other hand, we fail to see that we are revolutionaries on the crosses of our own prideful anarchy, shouting at the world in our shame. Give yourself up. Give yourself up. Give yourself to God and his people and his purposes. Give yourself up today. Look at the other criminal on the other side of the cross. Fleming Rutledge teaches us from the, the words we find in Scripture. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What made that robber think that Jesus had a kingdom? What and exactly how did he come to that idea? Maybe he read that inscription that Pilate put over Jesus' head, the king of the Jews. But it seems deeper. He seems to have gained a, an insight into things that were hidden, the power of God that was on display, even as Jesus seemed so utterly powerless. We're placed in the position through the Easter story of beholding Jesus on a cross and searching for the answer. Is Jesus the Lord of a kingdom? Is he really powerful? 
Is he powerful? And is that the kind of power that you and I want to go away today walking in? I said as we began, there's a temptation to hype us in the idea of resurrection power. But the, 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 the fault of that could be perhaps that you think it's something that it's not. That you think because Jesus rose from the grave that it means that you're always going to have health and wealth and prestige and position and possibility and possession. That's not the message here. But Jesus does have a kingdom. He does have power. And these words, remember me when you come into our kingdom, they can be our words at any moment of crisis in our lives. For the central idea here is that Jesus has power to save, to rescue and to deliver. And so Jesus, he's in his body on the cross, he's just as powerless as anybody else who was ever crucified before or after. The breath is agonizing for him to suck it into his lungs as he hoists himself up. He seems just as powerless, but what power does he have? He has the power to pronounce life. And he says to this one, This one who admits that whatever power he has, he's only misused. And that truthfully, he really has no power apart from Jesus. He turns to you and says, remember me. And Jesus, though he seems powerless, he speaks over him. And he says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is powerful in death. And he is powerful in resurrected life. Here's the truth. You and I, we will only be powerful if we also are united with him in death and in his resurrected life. Any other power is a false power. Paul tells us in the reading we had from Colossians before that although Jesus was stripped and shamed on the cross, Actually, Jesus himself was stripping and shaming all the false powers. All the false powers in our world in those moments. And defeating them. Defeating even death. In Colossians 2 and 15, we read that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. They tried to do it to Jesus, but it was actually done to them. Every hidden power, even death itself, was conquered as Jesus was laid bare for you and for me. How might we be powerful in the way of Christ's power? I've referenced this before numerous times over recent weeks by the Christian thinker and writer G.K. Chesterton. And whenever he was asked to account for what was wrong with the world, he would very quickly and simply answer, I am. I am. And I think it struck me so profoundly because I don't think that would be my first answer. I'm not sure it would be my fifth or tenth or hundredth answer. I think I can come up with lots of ideas and thoughts and many ways of, of kind of trying to fix the world. I am. I'm the problem. I am what's wrong. And I know on other occasions, very, very many times, I've referenced the experience of uh, of that Russian writer Solzhenitsyn who, um, during the terrors in in, in Russia, was was sent to the the gulag, to the, the prison camps. And there he was observing all of the people in those terrible dire straits around him. And consequently, he came to say that he had observed that the dividing line between good and evil was not found between different ideologies or between different nation states. It's not that one is good and one is bad. He said he couldn't even find that dividing line between good and evil, between one person and another. No, he said the dividing line between good and evil goes right down the middle of every human heart an understanding an understanding we're hopelessly broken and in need of Jesus we are upon that cross next to him and too many of us are are pridefully trying to say I'm still powerful do this for me Jesus do that we don't realize we're naked and ashamed Too few of us are on that cross recognizing our powerlessness and saying, 
remember me, Jesus. I am guilty, but you are my only hope. Here is true power. That Jesus, who was and is the highest of all, God in his glory, he doesn't seek to use his power and position to push others down. Though the Bible teaches us that the earth truly is the footstool of God on his throne, yet he doesn't grind us down in the dirt of our brokenness with his heel. The highest and most glorious one instead comes down to us. He reaches out to us. He gives himself for us. He conquers death for us. He reaches out his arms to both of those criminals on the cross. And having descended to earth, to death, to the grave, up he arose. He rises from the grave, bringing us up with him if we will accept his embrace. Here is true power. And it shows itself in in wonderful, surprising ways. Grab a hold of these things. That the first word we hear the risen Christ saying when he is from the grave. Can you guess what it is? Can you guess what the first word Jesus said when he rose from the grave? The first word we have recorded in here. What was the first word Jesus said? You're all looking at me blankly. Woman. Woman, that's the first word we have recorded. The the first word that Jesus, inaugurating the new kingdom of his risen life, says is a word that most people wouldn't say with any kind of respect in those days, that they wouldn't ever accord any decency to. And he says it to a woman, because Jesus' first witnesses were these ladies. You're all looking at me like, why is that important, Greg? I tell you, I spent hours with that the other night. I was stunned. The first word Jesus would say would be, woman, that's got to mean something. Does anybody want to do a Bible study on that and come back and tell me some more? Come on, this is good stuff. First thing he says, here is true power that the risen Jesus spends time with Peter. Spends time with Peter who filthily cursed the name of Jesus, denying him at his point of greatest need. There's a profound sense that the words Peter spoke over Jesus were worse than the words that violent criminal spoke over Jesus on the cross. They're worse. And yet Jesus walks with him after breakfast on a beach and he restores him. This is true power. That Jesus doesn't just appear to the disciples to encourage and empower them, but he comes again to the doubting one, Thomas, who proudly denies that it could be so. That Jesus doesn't just come to all the people in your church who seem to have it all together and who've got like their Christian faces on and it all looks great, but that he comes again to you when you're at home, doubting and struggling. And then he comes again and he gives you his hands and his side, and he says, come close. This is true power. And here is Jesus, as we read right at the beginning of our gathering, in John chapter 20, as after he had risen from the dead, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you, this is true power. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus said, and Jesus, when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The very power of the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ is given to us this is what power looks like Jesus taking this gospel of forgiveness and new life in Jesus to all who are in need this is power this is true revolution this is what our lives ought to look like this is a revolution of love and of the heart and I want to ask you this morning has it happened in you has your heart been turned upside down and inside out and all around about and again have you been changed have you been laid low by the risen Jesus or have you been lifted up by the risen Jesus 
There are many of us and we're too high and mighty and we need laying low. And there are some of us and we're, oh goodness, the chip on our shoulder. <laughs> so blooming big. And we're so busy fighting. But we need him to lift us up. This is what the power of the risen Christ looks like. Would you pray with me? And we're going to be led in worship for a little while as we conclude our gathering this morning. After we conclude, I encourage you to stay. There's tea and coffee and you can spend time with one another and celebrate and encourage one another and lift one another up. Right now, I want for us to really feel the eternal weight of glory. I want us to conceive of the power of our Savior, the power of the cross and of the resurrection. Place yourself on a cross beside Jesus. What are you saying to him? Are you ordering him around to do what you think you need, what you feel he should be doing? Or do you recognize that any power or agency you thought you had, any strength of arms, actually you're defenseless and weak and you need to simply call on him to remember you? Place yourself alongside a tomb with a stone rolled away. Maybe you're looking in from the outside or maybe you just darted straight in. And he is not there. He is risen just as he said. But in your confusion and in the fears that don't seem to go away as quickly as you thought they might, What are you saying to Jesus? Are you asking others, where has he gone? I, I, I don't know, I don't feel it, I'm not sure. I don't. Is there confusion? Place yourself in that garden. Maybe we could allow the tears of our inadequacy and our failings and our weaknesses to, to run down our faces. It'd be good sometimes if we would. What are we saying? When we can't see straight, when we're not sure what's happening. In your weakness. Jesus is present. He's powerful and he speaks and he turns everything upside down and you do well to let him and then he calls your name and everything's going to be right everything is going to be right Christians, here's the weight of glory that I want to rest on us. We need to stop living according to the kingdom of this world. It is passing away. It'll be gone soon. It'll be gone soon. And if you're busy trying to accumulate so that you can establish yourself and elevate yourself, I can't tell you how foolish that is. Or if you find yourself downtrodden and your heart is being so corrupted with anger or fear or pain, you're living in something that also is passing away. And Christ Jesus is calling you to something better. Give yourself up. 
give yourself up, exchange your power for his power. He's painted it so clearly for us. Give yourself up. Give yourself up. This morning we're going to conclude with worship. It was incredibly wonderful to be able to pray for two people earlier who said, I need Jesus. And I've never really given myself to him before, but I need to. There might be others of you here today and you need to do that. Well, while we're worshiping, come down to the front and say, I need to put my life in the hands of Jesus. I've never really done it properly, but I need to today. As I said before, there are others amongst us and we, we know that we're weak and powerless and empty. And, and Jesus comes to us today and he wants to breathe on us and fill us with his spirit. Come on down to the front. Be prayed for, be filled with the spirit. There are some of us today and we're, we're still wrestling with the deathliness of that tomb. And we need to come and pray again. Don't, don't just go away and say, well, I'll give it a shot. No, come again. His power wants to be at work within us. Come on. As we stand and as we worship, I, I want to see folks coming down the front here, not just to make me feel good. <laughs> I want you to take Jesus at his word. I want you to be serious. His power wants to be at work amongst us, but his power comes to those who are powerless on crosses, confused at empty tombs, weeping in gardens. His power comes to those who recognize that they have nothing, but that he has everything. Come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. Come and stand. Come on. Let's stand. Let's sing his worship. Let's sing his praise. Let's sing his resurrection power. But as we do so, I'm going to invite some of the elders of the church. They're going to join me down here. Come to Jesus today. If you know you need to, then just do it. And don't delay. Come and receive Jesus today. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Cause you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Cause you have broken every chain. 
There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, and hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip for me, cause you have every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Yes, you are a living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Oh, and your very body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Cause Jesus, yours is the victory. Yeah. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Cause you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me Cause you have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Jesus Christ, my living hope God, you are my living hope Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, cause you have broken every chain, and there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, Jesus Christ. My living hope, and God, you are our living hope. Thank you, Jesus. You are our living hope. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that each and every one of us, Lord God, would grow and indeed go in that hope, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray that all of the false hopes would be confounded, indeed destroyed, and that our hope in you would grow and rise. And Lord Jesus Christ, we want to hold forth that hope within this world, this gospel hope, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. We're going to continue worship our res- worship our resurrected Lord. Uh, and I'm aware that there are many of us and we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. So come on, come forward. We want to pray with you this morning that you'll be filled in greater measure with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to do just for this next little while. Like I've said, there's tea and coffee at the back. But before you fill yourself with that, come and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
can I say Jesus is better than coffee? Um, considerably. And uh, come on, I, you know, I'm being silly with you, but come on, come on. I know, you, I know what you do. You're like, oh, I, I'll just go home and I'll pray to Jesus. Oh, give over. Don't be so blooming daft. Come forward and let's pray for people and let's have something of the Spirit of God break out, eh? Come on, let's have some resurrection life in the place. So let's worship him and let's be praying. I feel like I want to pray for 50. Um, that's what I'm feeling like this morning. So come on, let, let's, let's make a start. Let's celebrate Jesus. Thank you.
Once again, it's been such a delight to be able to share together as a church this morning. And uh, we know uh, that taking what God has been doing in our lives, we can go and have wonderful weeks with him. Just to um, invite you um, to journey together with one another as we go through the week. We as a church, we don't just gather, but we get going into what God has for us together. And we have these things called transform communities. We would love to help you to connect with other like-minded people who are exploring God's goodness and grace and seeing how they can be a part of his transforming work in the world. So again, hit us up, get in touch. We'd love to help you to connect. Anything that you need, any prayer requests, do let us know. And we'll love to see you again this time next week. God bless you and bye for now.